Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so what I'm going to do tonight, um, I have to apologize to first to, to Jeremy Bonison and then also to you because I gave him the notes that he was trying to use and apparently gave him the wrong slides presentation. So he's working off a totally different set of material than, than I would have been working off of because that's so I, I, you, if you had seen my computer, you would know I've got this stuff all over the place in different folders for different reasons and different names, and it's all got the same content. But if I get the if I got the wrong one, then it's going to be off. You know, we'll be we'll be off the, down the road someplace, about to go over a bridge or something. But anyway, um, what I want to do tonight, because one of the things that he did, he he talked about some really cool things uh, that I wasn't going to get into in this series. Uh, because there's such a vast amount of information, and I didn't want to overload anybody as much with more than I needed to. Uh, but he covered a lot of good material, so I want to back up because he was looking for the pictures for what he was talking about. So I've got those pictures. I at least want to throw them up, and I'm going to read off the slides. I mean, you can read, but I'm going to read it too and make a few comments off of it because I don't have it in my notes. But I want to add those. But then there was a lot of blanks that are in the handouts that you had last week that uh, didn't get filled in. So what I did is I got a no handout. It's out there on the connections counter. It basically is this, the handout you had last week. This is maybe the first column and then second column and everything on the second page is all stuff that you didn't get. So I'm gonna try to give that all to you and I'm gonna move pretty rapidly, especially through the first portion of this thing. And so uh, mainly just to help you get the blanks and so please stop me if I'm going too fast on the blanks because I am going to be moving pretty quickly because I want to make sure I get this all done so that next week we can move on to the next next topic. Next topic is uh, uh, man and ev uh, evolution. And so we'll get into some evolutionary issues next week. Okay, so let's get started. See where my slides goes. Okay, so remember this verse. This is uh, the, the key verse, the primary uh, verse that we're launching off of, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And I would encourage everybody to memorize this if you haven't. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer in every, to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And that phrase that's, that's critically important uh, is emboldened. There it says to give an answer. Uh, and that simply means uh, to uh, the word, the Greek word, that's translated into English to give an answer. The Greek word is apologia, which is where we get the, con the topic apologetics, which means to give a defense. It doesn't mean to apologize. It doesn't mean, hey, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. You know, if you, I'd like for you to be one too, but you know, I'm sorry. Not like that. It's like, hey, I want you to be a Christian too because I have a reason for this truth to be accurate and, and I want you to know it. And so anyway, so that's the kind of verse. So I'm just going to talk about creation for just a few minutes because that's, I know Jeremy hit these, hit these blanks, so this is one of the reasons I'm going to go kind of quick on this first segment. But the first thing that, uh, so there, the apologetics to give an answer, uh, a defense or a reply. And then uh, we, he, he went through this list pretty quickly, um, the, uh, uh, the proofs of God, proofs that God exists. Uh, and we kind of covering through those. We're on number, lesson number six. Um, it says that collects the number six on yeah, just design and fine tuning. Fine tuning is what we did not get to last week. So I want to get to fine tuning tonight. That'll be the end of the subject. And then uh, uh, evolution and fossils. That's, everybody likes to talk about fossils, and so so we'll 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 delve, we'll we'll jump into fossils. Uh, and then uh, age of the Earth. How old is the Earth? How do we know how old the Earth is? And so we're going to talk about that. And um, and then morality, then we start getting into some more philosophical conversation the last few. The, the proof from morality, the proof from evil and suffering, and what I call the proof from the gospel of Jesus Christ, his, his, his resurrection, his reality, and his royalty. We're going to cover those three things. So that's kind of where we're going. Okay, so to create, this is one of your first blank, to give being to something new. So when you create something, you give being to it. If it's not there, it doesn't have a being. It's not existent. So uh, to, to Genesis chapter 1, we know Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, God created, in the beginning, God created. He gave being to creation. 
And so that's your first blank. It, uh, creation always has God as its subject. In Acts chapter 17, verse 4, 24, Peter, I'm sorry, not Peter, but Paul, when he's preaching, uh, he said that God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not with temples made with hands. God is the subject of this, of this whole study. God is the subject of what we're trying to do. And so now um, the next one uh, is a three-word blanks, but it can, it can, creation, things that are created can be matter, life, or spirit. And you can see that in Isaiah 45, verse 2, verse, I'm sorry, Isaiah 45, verse 42, verse 5. It says, thus saith God, thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens, and that's matter. God created matter. He created stuff, atoms, molecules, uh, particles, all this kind of stuff that, that makes up the universe. He created. He created the heavens. That's the matter. And he stretched them out. He, he that stretched, spread forth the earth, that which come out of it. He that giveth breath. That, remember, he, gave, he breathed into, the, into a lump of dirt and gave it life, and it became a man. So that's life. Upon the uh, unto the people upon it and spirit uh, to them which walk therein. So those are those three things. Just, you know, creation includes matter, life, and spirit. Isaiah forty-two five, and then there's no pre-existent substances by which other things were created. Uh, and that's an interesting thing to think about. There's nothing was pre-existent. Basically, what that means is God didn't have to have. Okay, so if you wanted to create a house. Let's just use a house. You want to create, you build a garage. You want to, what, what pre-existent material do you need to build a garage? Lumber? What else? Concrete? What else? Screws or nails? Um, maybe a door? Okay, so those are all pre-existent. When God created things in Genesis chapter 1, when he created, there was nothing pre-existent. There were, God didn't say, well, I better go down to the local material store and buy me up some material so I can create the universe. He didn't do that. He, he created the material to create the universe. Okay, so there was nothing preexistent in God. And the Latin term to use to describe this is ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. Out of nothing. We've talked about that before. I won't dwell on the topic here. Uh, so when God created, God also created time. You notice in verse 1, Genesis chapter 1 says, in the beginning. That, those two words, in the beginning, are three words. What that does is that establishes a clock. It, God starts the clock, right? He pushes, you know, like you get your timer out and you push, you know, you want to time things. Uh, how long is Randy going to talk? Time, start that. And so, you know, he, you, he pushed the start button and, he, and time has been under his clock ever since. Or the creation has been under his clock. And at the beginning of creation, God was sovereign because he is the creator and he is literally, he is the owner. You know, you build that garage. Well, unless you borrowed a whole bunch of money from the bank, you're the owner of that garage because you built it, right? Or that house or whatever. It's yours. And so at the beginning of creation, God was sovereign. And so we're convinced of this evidence that we're looking at. We're convinced because of three verses that Paul talks about, or I'm sorry, not Paul, but the Bible talks about. And in, in talking about the design of the creation, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 12, this says, I made, this is God speaking, I made the earth and created man upon it. I mean, that's a very specific statement. If you ever wanted to say, well, who, who said that God created? Well, he did. God said he created. I don't need to say it. He said it. And he said it quite better than I did, or I will ever do it. Then Hebrews eleven three says, through, the, through faith we understand that the world's were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. The things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That's that. There's no pre-existing substance concept. And then, of course, you're familiar with Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen by and understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Okay, so that's that's... The idea, the concept, the, the foundation of creation, when we're talking about creation. But what are some of the objections? Because there's a lot of people that object to, like, those verses that I just read. They object that God is the creator. They have some objections. So before we look 
at this new proof about cr proof of creation and design and stuff, um, we need to look at the objections. We need to go back and let the, other, let the objectors speak. And there's a reason for that. We're going to let the rejectors of God speak their mind first that we will be able to show why they're wrong, which is what God always does. God always lets the, the, the detractor speak first. You know why? Because he wants to, okay, you've said your piece, now let me tell you, what you why you're wrong. And in Isaiah chapter 41 uh, and verse 21, it's a really cool verse. God says, produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. God is selling people like... Um, uh, why can't I think of his name right now? Hawking and others. Like, you know, they, they're rejectors of the truth of God. And God is saying, okay, you speak. You Give me your cause. Give me your reason. You bring forth your strong reasons why I'm not the creator. And then <laughs> we're going to see why they're wrong. Okay, so um, I kind of had to mess up my notes so I can not... Redu uh, duplicate a lot of things, but let me just give you this. There's four, there may be four reasons or four ways that creation by God can be rejected. Rejectors of God being the creator, they've got maybe up to four different reasons, but there's only two possible outcomes to their reasoning. First, um, either human intelligence ultimately owes its origin to mindless matter. So if God didn't create it and, and, and everything, including you, came from a universe that started out of a whatever, then there is literally, there is, you owe your origin to mindless matter. That's the option. The second option is, and it really is strange that some people claim that it is their intelligence that leads them to prefer the first to the second. Um, because if, if either, either, your, either your mindless matter or there is a creator. That's the two choices. There is either mindless matter, or there is a creator. So no matter what present, no matter what argument somebody presents, even me, no matter the things that I'm saying to you right now, the things I've been teaching through this series, I'm teaching that there is a God. And you can say, well, I don't think so. And that's your choice. You can say, I don't think there's a God. I mean, everything you're saying, Randy, is wrong. And that's okay. But at the end of the day, you still have to decide, are you mindless matter or are you a creation of the living God? So that's kind of where it's at. Okay, so let's, give, let's look at the, uh, the arguments for against God creating. The first one is appeal to self-creation. Self-creation. So when I say self-creation, I mean literally that you created yourself. The universe created itself. Thing created something, whatever created itself. Um, many scientists, and Jeremy was was very clear about this. Many scientists and non-believers say that it's inconceivable that God would be the source of all matter, time, and energy. Okay, here, let me give you an example, and we, we you did see this last week, but this is Stephen Hawking saying it is reasonable to ask who or what created the universe. Okay, so that's a, he's saying that's a valid question. Where did the universe come from? Valid question. But, he says, but if the answer is God, then the question is merely deflected to that was who created God. Remember we talked about a couple of weeks ago, remember the, the chain link? We talked about that link of chain. He, he's basically defaulting back to one of the links down the chain. Okay, well, we can deal with all. We already dealt with that. We don't need to go through that again. Then he goes on and says, we claim, however, this is the scientific community claim, that it is possible to answer these questions purely within the realm of science without evoking any divine beings. Basically saying, uh, I can tell you where the universe came from just by using science. I can too. I can do the same thing he can do. He's, he, but the problem is I believe what I believe and he doesn't believe what he believes. Okay, so, okay, so self-creation, the, the term self-creation means an object or life somehow has created itself. So there's a word, there's a big fancy word called ontologically, or ontological word, that means to exist. The word ontological, so a thing cannot be ontologically prior to itself. Okay, so now everybody came from their mom, 
You couldn't have done that without being created. You couldn't create yourself in your mom's womb. I mean, the, the idea that you could create a human being is just silly. I know that Dr. Frankenstein tried to do that. You know, he tried to create it, you know, try to bring life to a dead, dead corpse. Didn't work too well. Uh, but anyway, to create yourself, here's the issue. To create yourself, you had to have existed prior to yourself. You can't create yourself if you don't already exist. Self-creation fails as an explanation of the universe because it is logically false. The universe cannot create itself because nothing can create itself. The next appeal that they would throw at you, the scientific community would throw at you, is an appeal for the start of time. Well, we, already, we just talked about time just a minute ago. In the beginning, God created. He set the clock. He started the clock. So um, start of time. And Stephen Hawking, has, we got another quote from Mr. Hawking. Many people do not like the idea that time has a beginning. I don't, does anybody have a problem with time having a beginning? I don't. Probably, he says, because it smacks of divine intervention. Oh, my goodness. So, so the, he's relating time to God, which I would totally agree with, because God created the clock when he said, in the beginning, God created Everything in Genesis chapter 1 and after, well, I should say everything after Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, is post-creation. The clock is ticking, and it's still ticking today. And so we know, we know that. So, so Hawking is just afraid. He's, it's a mumbo-jumbo line item that he just kind of throws out stuff. It smacks of divine intervention. I mean, come on. I mean, that's, uh, he's trying to shut you down before you even speak. It's not only possible, but it is exactly what God's word says, that he controls time, right? In Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, he is before all things, and by him all things consist. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, upholding all things by the word of his power. Okay, so start of time, Argue, anything about start of time type of arguments fail because of the proof from cause. When we talked about cause, one of the reasons we talked about cause so early on was because of this kind of argument. Well, who caused God? Who caused different things? And so we've already dealt with that. Log chain is probably the best example I have for you. Okay, but there are some other, there's a few others. So we've got start of time, self-creation, so on. What about, maybe you've heard of the expression multiple universes. Multiple universes. The multiple universe theory claims that there's more than one universe in the universe. I don't know where it would be, but more than one universe out there someplace. Uh, the multiple universe theory postulates that the simultaneous existence of many, possibly infin infinitely, infinitesimally, how does he say that word? A lot of them, uh, parallel universes. So anything which is theoretically possible, will ultimately be actualized in at least one of these universes. Basically, what that statement says is, okay, so we have, let's say, okay, we have, we're in all, we all agree we're in a universe, right? We are in a universe, God's kingdom. We're in a universe. And what science is saying, those that believe in multiple universes or propose multiple universes, are basically saying, okay, here's a universe, here's a universe. Okay, if you look up and you look at a picture of the of the night sky and you see all these galaxies, imagine for just a moment that every galaxy is a universe. At least one of those galaxies will have the the things that we need to live in. So, anything theoretically possible will ultimately be actualized in at least one of the universes. So, no matter what you think is possible, it's got to happen at least one of the universes. That's the theory. But it fails pretty big time as well. Um, therefore, we shouldn't be surprised that we found, in fact, there's nothing surprising in the fact that we have a universe that we do. The fact that we're in the universe, the problem with this theory about multi-universes is there is no scientific evidence for another universe outside of our universe. You know why I know that? Because we can't even get to the end of our universe we got a fancy telescope that, what's that? Okay, we had the Hubble, and then they just got a new one that just recently had pictures. What's it called? 
James Webb, it's like a movie star. James Webb Telescope is a pretty cool telescope, but it still can't see the end of the, of the universe. Maybe one day it can. I don't know. They'll tweak it and focus it and everything. Okay, but there's two problems with the multiple universe. There's two. There's one, one of them is a philosophical problem. Uh, basically says uh, a multiverse or multiple universe sh should still has the log chain problem. No force at the polling end. So the problem is the same. We're just keep, we just keep repeating the same same arguments back and forth. Such an issue is that limited to this universe, it applies to any reality. It's, so every reality, I mean, there's a reality in every universe. So all of the things that we're saying should, should apply to every one of them. Scientifically, there's several things that's wrong with this multiple, multiple universe thing. There are, as I said, there is no evidence for, for multiple universes. Now, we know that there's multiple galaxies because we can see them. We can photograph them. We, you know, we, we know that they exist, but we don't know how many universes there are. So somebody is sitting around, you know, having good old time on a Saturday night says, I bet there's more than one. And that became a theory in college. So that's kind of how that happens. And then the last thing that it says about scientifically wrong is, is one of the best proofs of this is a theory developed in 2003, which I did talk about. Um, and I'm not going to get back into again, but the guy that born board goose uh, Vulcan theory that they basically proved there could not be more than one theory, one universe. I don't get into all of that. If you want, if you want to know, I'll send you the information, but we've already covered it. So I don't need to cover it again. Um, last thing, the of the four objections would be quantum mechanic theory. And I talked about quantum mechanics last night, a couple weeks ago uh, that I taught. So I'm not going to go into that again, but that's basically, um, the smallest particle that man can find, and they think that that's where it all comes from. So, okay, so let me see where we're at here. Okay, so the argument from design. So this is kind of, we're bringing, we're, we're getting ourselves uh, back on track here. So the third proof of des uh, for God is the design or what's called a teleological argument. And the teleological argument, these are a couple of blanks for you, is the argument from design. And the teleological argument for God says that the universe and all humankind and everything in the universe exhibits marks of intelligence. That doesn't mean that everybody's smart. That just means that when you look at everything that's created, you see intelligent, intelligence behind the design of whatever that is. There is intelligence there. It's an explanation of the cause of things or events in terms of the aims, intentions, ends, or the designs of the designer. So we use the example of, going to, I'm going to build a garage. A lot of people like to sketch out what their, their garage is going to look like and maybe do some really, some really cool architectural drawings. Maybe you go and you've got you to gotta turn that into the county. I mean, you know, you've got to have drawings that show where all your wires are going to go and where your windows are at and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, so you've got to have a design. That's, that's intelligent design. So the word teleos is a Greek word that means end or purpose, and the word logia means a branch of learning. So end of learning would be the way you could say that. The word design is based in the sense that there's prearranged purpose, prearranged purpose, or there was no end, in, there was an end in mind. So basically, you get ready to start building a garage, you have an end in mind. I want the garage to be so big and so high, and I want it to have a place so I can put my tools. I want to be able to have a door going into the house, or I want to have a, you know, a walkway, rain-covered, you know, whatever, covered walkway to get to the house, whatever. I want it to be out in my backyard. You have an end design, a prearranged purpose for what you've designed to make. Very similar to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. And that's kind of hard to read, but I think everybody's familiar with Romans 1, 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now that verse right there, that is a design verse. That verse says that everything that's been created, you can see God in the design of what was created. Everything that God created is... In, is, is uh, I mean, whether it's a tree, you know, a tree has, you know, uh, three parts. Um, everything, ref everything references has an image of God. So let me give you a couple of quick pictures here. If you just, I think everybody's got your blanks. Hopefully, they do I can come back? 
But you look at Mount Rushmore. I went there a couple of years ago, first time I'd ever been there. I'm thinking, man, that is so cool. How did nature make that happen? I mean, that's an awesome thing, right? I mean, you know, you can see that there's, there's, there's a design involved in that because, well, there's humans there. But seriously, that's, that is a design feature. Somebody actually, if you've ever been there, there's a museum kind of thing, and they actually have a mock-up of what that looks like in a scale model so they could figure out how, how far out did they make the nose, how far down did they make the lips. They had to scale it. There's design involved in all of that stuff. That, you know, and so the creators, their, their, their handiwork is seen in that design. Here's another one for you that you can think about. Is You guys are all familiar with what those are, right? Indian heads. So did water and erosion create those? No, that's, that's somebody sitting around a campfire chiseling away at a, at a, at a piece of stone. You know, so, so, and depending on, I don't know this for a fact, but I would think that depending on the shape, you would know what tribe it was. So uh, let's go on. Uh, okay, so recognizing intelligence. Now, I'm not, we're not talking about taking an IQ test here, but we do need to recognize uh, some, some, some critical things. Intel intelligence is implied in anything that exhibits plans and designs. So when you see, like, okay, we'll go back to the building of the garage, door, garage building. There's a, there's a plan. You had a plan, and then there's a design. And, uh, and so you have to have plans and designs, and that implies intelligence. I mean, okay, now I'm not, a, I'm not somebody that can build a garage. My, my plan for building a garage is to hire somebody that knows what they're doing. Because I want their intelligence, not mine, because my intelligence wouldn't work. But there's three things uh, regarding intelligence that you should be able to identify when you see something and see the intelligence in it. Uh, first is function. A useful function as a result of a coordinated arrangement of co 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 cooperating parts. And what that means is, okay, so when you build that garage, you have to build your frame, right? You've got the wall frame, you've got the studs. It, it has to. You know, you can't put the roof on until you put the wall up. If you don't have a wall, your roof isn't going to go very far off the ground. So it, it's, in, it's, its function is important. The, the intelligence of the designer, the builder, the hammer swinger, that, that's seen in the design of how he puts the roof on, how he puts the walls up so he can put the roof on. Uh, and, then, um, and then the next one is complexity. Uh, complexity is within the ordered parts of the whole design. It's, you see complexity. Uh, you know, when you, uh, when you build a wall, when you build that, you know, sometimes you have to, yeah, you got, you got well, I don't know what they're all called, but you got different parts of the wall. And, the, and so they, they form a com complex structure that supports the weight of the whole building to keep it from falling down. Because if, if, if it's not structured properly and they're not complex, the building will fall down. And then the thirdly is specificity. Specificity is the intelligence or the intent and purpose contained in the object. So I'm building a garage because I need to house my Formula One race car driver, race car. That's specific why I'm building this garage. Now I'm, I already got a garage, so I could put my, that in there, but I had to get rid of Julie's car and she wouldn't like that. So. So I have to build a new garage. That's specificity. But when intelligent design is proposed as a cause for anything, that simply means that something cannot have happened purely by chance or dumb luck. Creation has, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 20, creation has the, hand, has the imprint of God in it. And everything that you see, you see God in some way. And so intelligent design is a purpose as a cause for anything that, mean, that, that means that something cannot have in, happened per, purely by chance or dumb luck. The evidence for God then is, is in the design of creation. The evidence for God, we're talking about proof for God. This is what this, this, this concept, this, this topic design is... Um, 
the evidence for God showing us that, that he has designed everything. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 12. I have made the earth, he said, and created man upon it. I, even my hands, he said, my hands have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I com commanded. Isn't that a cool verse? God says, I stretched out the whole heavens. I mean, I don't know exactly how he did it, but in Genesis 1, it was in his word, and he spoke it, and now he stretched it out with his hands, and it's huge, and it's never-ending, it's ever, ever growing and ever expanding. I'll give you an example, another different kind of an example. Every masterpiece of art can be identified by the artist because within the creative strokes of the brush are the identity of the artist. You know a Rembrandt painted because you, you examine how he, how he did the strokes, how heavy, how thick, how, how angles and stuff. I'm just talking because that's what I was told. You guys may even know better, but, but I do know that, you know, they know that that's a forgery or that's not really a Rembrandt because they look at the way it was painted and they said, no, Rembrandt didn't do that. Rembrandt didn't do that. The same is true of God. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. So we cannot see God, but we can know that he exists through the evidence seen in his creation. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made by the things which do appear. Okay, so that brings us, so that's kind of, that, that's, that gets us to where we we're talking about the, the teleological argument about design. Stated in three, verse, three, three statements, very simple, very quickly. Uh, behind every complex design is a designer. The universe has a complex design. And the third statement is, therefore, the universe has a designer. But when you look at the universe as best you can from within the universe, you look at the universe and you see evidence of a designer. And, and then when we get to the last part of this lesson tonight, I'll lay out some of those evidences for you and you'll see what I'm talking about. So just think about Psalm chapter 19, Psalm 19, verse 1 to 4. And this, I'm sorry, that's, just, that's hard to read. But it says, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. The heavens declare the glory of God. What's it, what's, what is the glory of God? That he is real. That's one, that's one aspect of God's glory is that he is real. The heavens declare the glory of God. When you look at the heavens and you see everything that's up there, you know, what we, well, all we can see is stars and planets and moons. And you know, if you have a big telescope, you see galaxies and stuff like that. But all of that has, has the hand of God touch on it. Okay, let me, this is a good question to ask. I think that's how I wanted to work this. Does the universe and life exhibit design? Okay, does it or not? Does it, uh, does the universe and life exhibit design? I think it does, but again, let's go back and let the disputers say their piece first. Okay, so here's a guy, you may have heard this guy, Richard Dawkins. He is a loudmouth atheist, and he says this. Living objects look designed. They look overwhelmingly as though they're designed. Biology, biology is the study of complicated things which give the impression of having been designed for a purpose. Okay, I mean, come on. You're basically saying that when you look at biologic, biological stuff, you see a design, but we have to say that it is not there. Okay, well, in case you didn't get that from him, listen to Francis Crick. He is a, the co-discoverer of DNA. That's how, that's a, that's a pretty intelligent guy. Atheist answer, he's, okay, the question is, does the universe and life exhibit design? His answer, oh, yes, but biologists must constantly, this is an incredibly arrogant statement, biologists must constantly keep in mind 
that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. So basically, when you're looking at that microscope and you're looking at that stuff in your microscope or in, in your lab, be, keep telling yourself, no design here, no design here, no design here, no design here. No matter what design you see, no design here, no design here, you have to keep telling yourself. And then we have one more guy. I like this guy, Frank, uh, Philip Johnson. He was a supporter. He's a supporter of truth. He was a former atheist. He became a believer. Uh, and I can't read everything. This, uh, Berkeley law professor, some other stuff there. But anyway, Darwin, Darwinian biologists must keep repeating that reminder to themselves because otherwise they might become conscious of the reality that it is staring them right in the face and trying to get their attention. There is a designer. He's saying, he's saying they had, it's really funny because right after Francis Crick, who just says you have to keep saying to yourself that doesn't exist, doesn't exist, there's no design, uh, Johnson here says that's what they have to keep telling themselves. This is really cool. Okay, there are some, I'm going to give you this real quick because I don't want to dwell on this one. I don't want to bore everybody out, but there are five classical versions of design. And so just so you know, if you ever come across these names, you know who they are. First one is uh, it was called Aquinas's fifth way. Aquinas was a, um, he was uh, a, a Catholic uh, priest, uh, and he said this, every agent acts for an end, even natural agents. Now what acts for an end manifests intelligence, but natural agents have no intelligence of their own. Therefore, they are directed to their end by some intelligence. So basically saying everything has intelligence, whether it's within them or controlled by them. And intelligence controls everything. That's his fifth way. And I, in, in HBI, if you want to get really expansive on this, we go through all five ways with him. I'm not going to do that today. Um, basically, he's saying things look like they have a reason to exist. They have a purpose. He said, you just see the purpose. And when you look at them, you can see what their purpose is. Their mere, mere possibility of an argument for purposelessness, evolution, means that there's no need to have an intelligent being. That's what evolution tries to push out, is that there is no, there is no need for intelligent being. Um, the simple, simple argument from analogy, the material world looks like something humans would design. I mean, when you look at the world, you think, well, that's a design. I mean, that, you know, humans would have done that. It just makes logical sense that, yes, that's a design. David Hume, who was, uh, I don't remember when he lived, but in, in the 1700s, 1700, I think, he rejected this argument because of its inherent weakness. Similarities do not always equate well with each other. Basically, he's arguing against that. Then there's one more, makes perfect sense, called Paley's watchmaker argument. Uh, William Paley in 1743 to 1805 was when he lived. He had, he came up with, he, he had a, an, a brilliant idea. What if I was walking along in the woods and I found a watch on the ground? As soon as I pick up that watch, it's known intuitively that there was an intelligent designer who made the watch. The watch can't make itself. If it performs a function, I mean, we talked about function already. It performs a function for that, that, uh, that would be regarded as valuable. You have a timepiece now. It could not perform the functions of keeping time if it had different parts. You know, a, 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 time, a stopwatch, a timekeeper, a watch, you know, most, most everybody has a digital watch these days, and so it just clicks over digitally. But, you know, if you took the numbers off, if you took that little number pad, your watch would be nothing. It doesn't accomplish anything because you can't see what time it is. So an attempt by Richard Dawkins to discredit the Paley... Uh, Paley's watchmaker argument, was tempted in 1986. He, he attempted to, to make this assertion in 1986 that a program generating random nut letters, you know, so if you, you know, so if you know anything about writing a program on, on a computer, I'm not talking about like using Word, I'm talking about actually programming. Program a computer that it would, every so many seconds, it would click out a new letter and print it on the page. He's saying this. If you could write a program ge that generated random letters, it could eventually generate an intelligible statement that said this, methinks it is like a weasel. Now, 
Okay, so could you could anybody write a program that it would just randomly generate letters every two seconds and it would print on paper and eventually it would come out to that? It's a very similar to the argument that you could put a typewriter in front of a monkey and eventually the monkey will type out a, a coherent sentence just by hitting the keypad. I don't think so. It reminds me of the joke. I got to tell this joke. You probably have heard this joke. Maybe I've even told you before. Two scientists were challenging God about who can create. So, you know, God reached down and he took the dirt and he formed the dirt and he breathed into it and it became a human, became a living form. Scientists said, okay, we can do that. They reached down and grabbed the dirt. The guy says, no, 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 you got to make your own dirt. That's a dad joke. Okay, so anyway, that wasn't very funny. The more contemporary versions of this argument, these arguments, is what we call the fine-tuning argument, the argument from fine-tuning, which is really what we want to get into. We're almost done. We're going to cover a few other things, but I want to talk about fine-tuning. So what is the fine-tuning argument? Scientists have determined that life could not exist if a growing list of properties in the universe were altered, even one margin of a percentage point, life would not be possible in this universe. In the force of the explosion that created the universe, if it had been different by one part in 10 to the 60th power, the universe would have been altered even a margin of the percentage point. It would not, life would not have been possible. The universe would have either collapsed or expanded so fast that stars would not have formed. So whatever the, whatever the power was when God spoke and the universe became existent, I'm not talking about the Big Bang. I'm just talking about God spoke in the Word and the, and the thing created. Whatever that power was, if it had differed by one part in 10 to the 60th power, the universe would have collapsed on itself. The fine-tuning argument also has, has, has its objections. People object to the fine-tuning argument, and we'll talk about those at a later date, not to, when we'll get into those days. There's two kinds of fine-tuning that I do want to talk about. The first one is called irreducible biochemical complexity. Now, this is kind of where Jeremy was at with all the things that he showed. I'm going, to, I'm going to retrace his steps on this as well. We're actually doing really good on time, surprisingly. I'm going, and nobody stopped me, so I guess I'm doing a good pace of speed here. Okay. Irreducible biochemical complexity. A system of living organisms, either cumulatively complex or irreductibly complex. Either, you, that's the choice. You either, either you're cumulatively complex or irreductibly complex. So what does that mean? What do those words mean? Con commu communal, commu oh gosh, I'm sorry. Um, now I'm trying to slow down. Cumulative systems have parts of their system removed and still are able to function. So um, talking to our friend Mike Shore today, and he blew a head gasket in his engine. Okay, so the head gasket's gone now, but he's still driving his truck. I mean, he's had to drive it to the mechanic to get it worked on. But, you know, so there's a part that's not there now that he needs, but it didn't keep the, the engine from going. That's, that's complex, cumulative complex complexity. Because a, a motor is a pretty complex device. Irreductible systems will fail or die if you take out one component. Irreducible systems will fail or they will die if one component of that system is removed. I gave you the example already. If you have, even on your digital watch, if you take the, the little uh, digital things that display the numbers in your watch, if you remove those, your watch is useless. It doesn't function. It's dead. Might as well throw it in the trash. It doesn't work. I'll give you a couple of other examples. Um, Okay, so the, a watch is irreducible. I don't know if you, if you've, how many of you ever seen the inside of a, like a, a pocket watch, a wind-up watch? A few people, anybody, a couple people, okay. When you take the back off and you look inside there, there's all kinds of little gears and springs and things that are moving around and flying around, all kinds of things. Okay, you take out one of those gears and now your watch is broke. It doesn't work. You have to take it to a watch repair shop and hopefully they can find the right part number. So they get a watch, get your watch going again. Uh, a mousetrap, everybody's familiar with the typical, 
old fashioned watch, spring loaded or, or mousetrap, spring loaded bar. That's irreducible. You take one part of that the mousetrap away, and it won't catch a mouse. The lock bar, the killing bar, the the the, uh, the piece of wood that it's on. You take all of that out. You take any one. Of, there's only three parts. You take one, and it does not a mousetrap anymore. So I got a statement here. I don't know if I put it in the screen or not. Uh, we'll get to specify biological here in just a moment. Um, actually, I put this note in your in your notes. I think. Let me double check. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. There it is. Under contemporary arguments, there's a there's a bold paragraph that I put in your notes. I just want to read that. Make sure you have it. One very important characteristic of irreducible complex systems is the fact that they can never be produced by even the slightest successive modifications via evolutionary change, because by definition, a missing modification via evolutionary change, um, because by definition, a missing part makes the system non-functional, therefore unable to reproduce. Now, okay, so what's buried in that statement is this. Evolution cannot create, morph into, from one, one device, one life form into another life form, and that new life form be irreducible. Compl it, there's no way, because if, if it didn't have the part before, you can't give it the part that it needs because you don't know what part it needs to make it live. So evolution cannot create something that is irreducibly complex. Evolution can't do it. It's not possible. So that's a key, ver that's a key statement that you guys need to hang on to Whenever you're talking to somebody about evolution and, and you, you, you frame it about evo, uh, irreducible complexity. Okay, um, so, the, uh, so the second argument is up here, specified biological complexity. So there's a difference between irreducible complexity and specified biological complexity. Speci specified biological complexity deals with generating life itself. So... Basically, Darwin, Darwinian theories claim more complex living organisms arise from more simple, simplistic organisms over long periods, periods of time, but not the origin of life itself. So specified biological complexity talks about where did life come from? Evolution cannot produce, Darwinian theories of evolution cannot produce, a, take a simplified organism and, and over a long period of time, create a more complex organism that is alive. It, evolution can't do that. There's two problems with the naturalistic origin of life. That would be the origin of, you know, coming not a uh, non-God or, origin. How can non-organic substances combine to form amino acids necessary for the building blocks of life? Every cell has amino acids in them. Your body needs amino acids in order to reproduce itself and to keep going. Non-organic substances, uh, naturalistic origin of life cannot produce that thing. And it cannot also, uh, where did the information go that is contained in DNA origin? Where did, the D, where did your DNA in intelligence and the information in your DNA come from? Where did that information come from? Everybody's DNA has information in them. You probably have heard other people talk about the DNA, and it, it's, it's got the coding to make you, or DNA in a, in a horse, or DNA in a, in a frog. I mean, every, every living cell has DNA in it. Where did the information in the DNA come from? That's, that's a whole nother topic that we're not going to get into tonight, but I just wanted to mention that because I think it's really a valid question. Where did the information in, the, in DNA come from? There's only one source where information could have come from. That would be the creator. The information doesn't just randomly happen. Okay, so I want to go back to where Jeremy was at for just a moment. Jeremy talked about butterflies. Remember him talking about the butterfly, the monarch butterfly? So he's trying to find these pictures and I gave him the wrong slide, so now I'm going to show you the picture. Everybody knows what a monarch butterfly looks like, right? So that's, that's, there's, that's two of them there, in case you didn't know. Uh, they are the king of the butterflies because of their, their life cycle, and it's pretty cool. 
Uh, evolution, evolution has claimed that, okay, how many, do you guys know that, a, that mo the monarch butterflies can only lay eggs on and eat this milkweed plant? They will not land on any other plant. They will not lay their eggs on any other plant. So evolution has claimed that flowers and butterflies co-evolved together. Okay, so the milkweed plant is a poisonous plant. It will kill you if you try to, you know, like chew on it or anything, get that milkweed juice in you, you'll die. But the, but the monarch butterfly doesn't die. It lives in there, so it's cohabitating with this plant. And evolution, is, ev evolution fixed that. Evolution made that happen, is what most, most scientists would try to claim. How can an insect and a plant survive long enough to evolve together? I mean, if there wasn't a milkweed plant, what did the, milk, what did the monarch butterflies land on first? I mean, this, you know, it sounds kind of a crazy question, but it's not. Okay, so uh, you probably are familiar with the term metamorphosis, the change. By its nature, metamorphosis is an all or nothing proposition. And throughout biological history, its success has hinged upon immediate availability of a full set of instructions, including genetics, proteins, the development of programs, uh, the developmental program required to integrate them, and it all has to be in place at the same time. The cool thing about this, not just this butterfly, but I think every butterfly, they start off as a, as a uh, caterpillar. That would be the thing on your left. But eventually, after so many molts and it changes and it gets bigger and it splits the skin and then discards the skin, eventually it just says, I, I'm, okay, I think I'm where I need to be. And it said, it'll attach itself to that milkweed plant, lay some eggs, and what it actually does is it sinks, it sinks a hook into the plant, bends three times, wraps it with, with, uh, with some silk around it three times, and secures it three and three. It's kind of cool. And then when it gets ready to split, of course, I think everybody knows. Let me get past all of this stuff here. You got a cocoon on the left, and it splits. And, but what was in the, you know, that thing in the, on, the, on your left, that's what was in the cocoon at the beginning was a caterpillar. 16 legs, a bunch of eyes. All it sees is black and white. I don't know how they know that, but that's what they say. And, and then so after a few hours, the chrysalis hardens and the caterpillar dies. The caterpillar dies inside the shell. And in short order, a butterfly comes out. Now, instead of having 16 legs, it's got six legs. Instead of having... Uh, very simple eyes. It has a complex eyes. It also has a, uh, I can't think of the, the, let's see, where's up here? It has 16 legs, a mouth, six eyes that can see black and white. The butterfly has six long legs, a proboscis. That's the tube for getting the nectar out of the, out of the flowers. And, and it can see in color and it can reproduce and it can fly. So it went from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Now, not, I mean, other butterflies do this too, so but this is kind of cool because of its, of its, this is a migratory animal. It migrates from Canada all the way down to Mexico and back again. Does it go to Guatemala? Well, that's cool. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, it is kind of a neat thing. They go to, they go down to Mexico, Guatemala for winter. But the, the, the butterfly that flies to Mexico is not the butterfly. Uh, it's, there's like three generations from Mexico back to Canada. Three, mix, three, three generations of butterflies, but somehow the butterfly knows where to go. Okay, so let me, let me get past all of this. I'll show you one more. Oh, he talked about the giraffe. I wanted you to see a picture of a giraffe in case you didn't know what a giraffe was. I think everybody did know that. But did you understand what he was talking about, about the, the blood going to the head and there's a, the, uh, the, um, the, the, uh, moving the blood up and down the neck and this uh, has a design, especially a design heart and that pressure regulation is called a ready mirror ball. And so that's basically like a big sponge or a capacitor. If you think about a capacitor storing energy till his head goes down or goes back up again. So we'll skip on that because my favorite, my second favorite item is the human eye. And that's a kind of, a, this is a cool thing. The eye's retina is less than one square inch 
in surface, but it contains 137 million light-sensitive receptor cells. Some are cones and some are, I can't think of the other ones they're called, but a healthy eye can see, and this is incredible. I'm one of the days I have to check this. A healthy eye, and it wouldn't work for me, I don't have healthy eyes, can see the light of a candle 25 miles away. And that's, that's pretty incredible. I guess in this really dark, you can see that light. Because, I mean, think about it. You can see stars. There are millions and millions and millions and millions of miles away from us. Uh, the retina does 10 million calculations per, uh, pre-processing before the image ever gets to your brain. And they produce three types of tears, which I think is kind of cool. You know, everybody just thought when you cry, you just cry, you know, the crocodile tears. Well, that's not on the list. You have basal tears for lubrication. You have reflex tears for flushing when you get something in your eye. And then you have emotional tears that produce a pain reliever. Isn't that kind of cool? And this one is, this one is my favorite, the blood, blood clotting and the blood, blood system. Now, every single person here, especially when you're a kid, you cut yourself, you scraped your knee, you damaged your skin, and you bled all over the place. Didn't, didn't you get a scab? And then you... The scab falls off and it heals, and you don't even think about it. You know, it just happens so quick. That's that's God. That's such a cool thing. Anyway, the blood has got four pieces in it. It's got sixty thousand miles of arteries and veins. It's got uh, five to six quarts of blood in every adult. Uh, it consists of four major components: your your plasma, which carries the oxygen, uh, your red blood cells. No plasma. Well, that's just that's just everything and your red blood cells, and then your platelets, and then your white blood cells, which is your immune system. So the red blood cells, there's 25 trillion red blood cells in the body. Uh, red blood cells live 120 days and are destroyed in the spleen. Isn't that weird? Your spleen destroys your blood cells. Red cells are then replaced at a rate of 2.5 million per second out of your bone marrow. The hemoglobin molecule gets its red color and is what allows, you, uh, the, the, allows it to carry oxygen due to and a protein that contains iron. And uh, this, this is how, I think, I think Jeremy talked about this or mentioned it, a system that could never have produced by evolutionary processes. Because in order for you, if you cut yourself, it, it, no matter how deep you cut yourself, you cut a vein open or a, cat or a, or a vessel or whatever, you're going to bleed just natural, um, but your body immediately goes to work and triggers a sequence of 30 different things that have to happen in order for you to have a clot, and then for that clot to finish, to, to break away and go away, and your skin is healed. And I, I have the whole list. I'm not going to go through the list, tonight, but it is really fascinating. Every, you know, I got scars all over me right now, you know, where I got different things, and you do too, probably. Uh, or have had anyway. So the clotting is necessary for survival in all of life. Now, some people have, have um, I can't remember what it's called, but a disease where they don't clot. So unfortunately, that's a problem for some people. Clotting is referred to as a cascading process. There's 30 steps in the cascade. One has to happen before the next. They have to happen in order. And so that's the cool thing about design is... You can't start with step 25. You have to start with step one, and then step two, and then step three, all the way down to step 30. And you have to create the clot, not close up the blood, the blood vessel. So the clot covers your wound, but it can't close up the blood vessel. Otherwise, you know, you get clots, and your clots flow down into your heart. You get to have a heart attack, and you die. You don't want the clot in your blood vessel. But it has to seal the blood vessel so the blood vessel doesn't keep leaking and you don't bleed to death. And your skin has to get in, initiated in there and your skin has to heal. So when the, when the scab falls, I got, I got scabs all over my arm right now. I was kind of holding my arm. So when the scab, when the scab falls off, your skin starts, has, has, has already started healing. So I, I just think it's a cool thing. So these are, Jeremy uh, used the, the phrase, uh, we had uh, 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 icons of creation. And I get a chart, it's got 25 of them in there. We didn't, we didn't lay out that 25, but, but there's at least 25 icons of evolution, just like there's, I think, 16 icons of, of 
let me rephrase that, 25 of creation and 16 of evolution. The evolutionary community pushes these 16 things, and we'll be looking at those starting next week. Um, okay, so clots begin to form and so on. We'll, let's go on past all of this. Um, one more, I think. Okay, he mentioned the bombardier beetle. And I, so I had to throw the bombardier beetle up there because I think it's kind of a cool. The ultimate concealed carry insect. It actually has a concealed carry weapon that it carries. So the bombardier beetle uses a unique defense mechanism. It shoots its enemies with hot boiling liquids in a pulsating fashion out of its rear end. Uh, it stores hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinine in its abdomen in two different taint chambers. And when, he gets a t when he's threatened, he mixes these two together and then squirts them out. When threatened, it mixes the two, as I said, with enzymes that oxidize the chemicals, making them highly irritating and extremely hot. Here's the uh, video. This is what we're going to show this video. It's like a two-minute video, but it's kind of cool. I hope you can Bombardier see it. beetle. Flip the lights if you can. It can create a chemical reaction within its body so violent that boiling caustic liquid explodes out of its abdomen. By pulsing the jet 500 times a second, it keeps its rear end just cool enough to prevent it being cooked. That's the bombardier beetle. Now, it had to figure out how to create two tanks and put hydrogen chloride and hydro, hydro whatever those two things were, in, in there. Those are, you know, caustic chemicals. Mix them together and not die, not blow his rear end out. Okay, let's go on. We're almost done. Um, the anthropic principle uh, means related to human existence, anthropic principle relates to human existence. Human existence depends on specific cosmological constants. Remember, the universe is specifically made for us to live in. The anthropic principle says that the universe appears designed for the sake of human life. Basically, if the, if the, if the design of the universe wasn't as exactly where it was, we would not be able to live in this universe. Uh, the term fine-tuned does not mean designed. I think there's a couple of blanks that you guys throw in there. We're defining what fine-tuning is. The expression of fine-tuning is a neutral term. It doesn't say anything about how the fine-tuning is best explained or how it came to be. It's just identifying fine-tuning. These things appear to be fine-tuned. Fine-tuning just means that the range of life-permitting values for con constants and quantities is extremely narrow. Basically, the things in the universe that allow us to live, if you cataloged them all, there's a very narrow window. All of these things have to be lined up in order for us to live. There are two kinds of fine-tuning. There's what's called natural, um, natural con uh, constants, a natural constant are those quantities that exist regardless of the laws of nature. Example would be gravity. Gravity is a constant. It's just everybody's exposed or experiences. We all, no matter where we're at in the world, we experience the same amount of gravity. Uh, all of us do. These constants have unchanging quantities, and nature does not determine the value of these, of these constants. So that's natural constant. Then you have arbitrary constants. An arbitrary constant are those quantities that are put into the initial conditions and that the laws of nature act upon or separate in order for life to exist. So these constants or these quantities are not determined by laws of nature. So law, nature doesn't have anything to do with this. We like to, we like to give nature credit and give nature um, uh, accolades for doing what nature does. But nature didn't do these things. This has nothing to do with nature. This is all God and how he designed the universe. Evidence for special preparation for human existence shows up in the characteristics of the solar system as well. All the way, 
as early as 1960, the astronomers could identify just a few solar system characteristics. So, you know, you got to wonder, what, is, what do scientists do when they're out there in the desert and they got this massive telescope and they're just, you know, are they just playing pinochle or what are they doing? Well, they're studying different kinds of things and they're trying to measure different things about the universe. I mean, that's some of the things that they do. And so uh, by the end of 2001, astronomers had identified more than 150 finely tuned characteristics. 150 finely tuned characteristics. In the 1960s, the odds that any given planet in the universe would possess the necessary conditions to support intelligent physical life were shown to be less than one in 10,000. One of the things that scientists and astronomers and all those kind of people are trying to do today is find another planet that life could exist on it. You know what they're actually doing? They're looking for these constants. They're trying to find these constants that are in our universe and our solar system and match them up with another planet and another solar system and say, okay, that one could contain life because out of the 150, and there's actually more, I'll get you that in a minute. Out of the 150 uh, constant, um, what I call them? I lost my own train of thought here. Quantities, these constants, uh, Maybe they find a planet that's got 35 of them. They say, okay, life could possibly exist there. But you need more than that. Okay, so in, in 2001, these odds shrank to less than one in a number so large that it might as well seem like it's infinity, 10 to the 173rd power. That's a lot of zeros. Astrophysicist Hugh Ross, his, had a, he, I, got a, I got a book by him. It's a great book. You gotta, if you ever want to read a book, that's a book to read. He's a believer. He's an astrophysicist. He calculated the odds of all the anthropic constants and quantities. At the time when he did the calculation, it was 122 constants. To be in, 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 they had to be 122 of them had to be in place for any planet in the universe by luck alone to be one in chance, one chance in 10 with 138 zeros after it. Only one planet, he's saying, could possibly, and of course, what planet is that? I think it's Earth. Okay, so let's go on. We're almost done. This number becomes even, so, even more incredible, and I don't know how they figured this out, but when one realizes that there's only 10 to the 70 atoms in the entire universe, they have no idea how they measured that number, but that's what, that's what they compare to. Mathematicians point out that the only that anything that exceeds 10 to the 50th power is the same thing as saying zero chance. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so here's some of the fine tuning. I think I have eight, seven, eight, seven or eight. I got eight because I got one I just added tonight. Number one is oxygen. 21% of our atmosphere. I think everybody knows this, right? 21% of our of our atmosphere is oxygen. If 25%, if it was 25%, fires would erupt everywhere. If it was 15%, we would suffocate. 25% is, or 21% is a key number. Too much oxygen, well, everything will go on fire. Not enough oxygen, we'll, we'll choke to death. That's, that's the first fine-tuning thing, o oxygen level. Secondly, is gravity. Uh, it must specifically be, it must be specifically set Altering gravity, and I got a big long number there with zero point, like 25 zeros, one percent. Uh, the um, the sun would not exist if 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 you altered gravity by that number, the sun would not exist, and the moon would crash into the earth by changing gravity by that much. Centrifugal force. The centrifugal force of a planetary movement does, did not precisely balance the gravitational force. Nothing could stay in orbit. So you got this gravity pulling on us, pulling us towards the sun, and the centrifugal force of the planet going on this way balance each other out. If we, if we lose that balance, we're going to crash into the sun. Expansion rate? Is that what that says? Yeah, expansion rate. Um, if the universe was expanding at a rate one millionth more slowly than it is, the temperature on the Earth would be 10,000 degrees. You think we have heat waves yet? Location of the planets. 
If Jupiter was not exactly where it is, the Earth would be bombarded by space material that would threaten life on the planet, you know, meteors and comets and all that kind of stuff that crash into the planet. Um, Earth's crust. If the thickness of the Earth's crust was greater, too much oxygen would be transferred to the crust to support life. And if it were thinner, volcanic and te tectonic activity would make life impossible. The tilt of the Earth. So, so we're just looking at nine or eight of them. And there's 122, according to Hugh Ross. So um, Earth crust, if the thickness of the Earth was greater, too much oxygen. Oh, I'm sorry, Earth tilt, where it tilt. The axis of the Earth is set so carefully that if it were altered ever so slightly, surface temperatures of the Earth might be far too great. So when somebody says, well, we got uh, global warming, you say, yeah, because we're tilted the wrong way. They'll look at you like, what are you talking about? There you go. Okay, so uh, let me throw in one more. Yeah, one more that is not on the list that I just read about two days ago uh, in a uh, magazine. It was an online magazine. Um, let's see, where is it? New Scientist magazine and also on uh, Microsoft News. Both of them had it. They say that if a star passes through our solar system and causes the planet Neptune... To, to go one point or go point one percent closer to the sun, the entire solar system would be destroyed. So things like Neptune, which is the eighth planet out in, you know, it's that far away. If, it, if it's not there, we're not here. That's basically it. Okay, so let me give you some options for fine tuning. This is the one I didn't do, do the options first. I did ours first. Physical necessity. So, you know, somebody wants an explanation here. Uh, the constants and quantities must have the values that they do so that the universe is of necessity, life permitting. There is a physical necessity. We have to have a, a, a universe, a solar system, a planet that has all of the criteria for keeping us alive. If we don't have that kind of home, we're not going to find another one on another planet. We're not going to find these characteristics, these constants on, on another planet. However, nece necess uh, necessity is not an option. There is no evidence that life permitting universes are necessary, right? We talked about multiple universes. We don't need multiple universes. We, we're fine where we're at. Um, in fact, it is more probable that life prohibiting universes are far more likely. So no matter how many theories Somebody says, well, there's, you know, there's 25 possible universes. Well, at least 24 of them are hostile to life, basically what that's saying. And then we have chance. The effort to m multiply the number of universes in order to reduce the improbability of the occurrence of fine-tuning. Basically, it exceeds any mathematical possibility. As for the multi-universe, no empirical data exists to confirm its existence. And lastly, was, would be uh, intelligent designer. That's your choice. You, you, the physical necessity, chance, or intelligent designer. That's the three options that we have for, for all of these things. We would call this designer God. And the evidence here is seeing Stephen Hawking, uh, even, St even he admits it. And I don't think I have that on his slide. Yep, I do. The initial configuration, this is what Stephen Hawking says about fine-tuning. The initial configuration of the universe appears to have been very carefully chosen. Now, those three words imply intelligence, very carefully chosen. Who did the choosing? Uh, nature. No, God. Okay, so there we go. Uh, that's lesson six. I uh, apologize for having to go through a lot of that twice, but I wanted to make sure your blanks were filled in so you had all the data that you needed. And uh, I wanted to give you some pictures, and I definitely wanted to show you the bombardier beetle. That's a cool animal. Okay, next week, let's see where we're at next week. Next week, we're going to be talking about evolution and fossils. Um, you, I think you'll enjoy that one as well. Any questions on anything? Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the uh, 
the opportunity to get through all of this material, Lord. And I do pray, Father, that, uh, um, that it would be profitable that we've gone through it twice uh, to get everybody on the same page. And, Read some uh, bookmarks. Just ask, Father, for your blessing on the rest of the evening. Give us safety as we travel home. And, Father, again, for everybody that's on our prayer list, we ask that you would move in their life so that their friends, family, workers, co-workers, doctors, medical people, anybody sees them, they would see your hand on their life. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.